So first of all, uh, general slide. Um, so what we are doing in TVB, what we are interested in uh, are uh, um, the brain dynamics and uh, basically you want to study the, the behavior uh, in um, the functioning but also dysfunctioning brain. And uh, there especially we are interested in the underlying mechanism. Why? Because we can then uh, try to find ways to change uh, um, uh, the state of the brain, like uh, let's say from dysfunctioning to functioning, or we can also uh, use this machinery to explain, let's say, task-related uh, uh, brain signals. Okay, so the concept in general is uh, that uh, we consider the brain as a network, the network of interacting uh, population and neural masses, um, and uh, the basis for that, so what we are using, um, um, is uh, yeah, structure measurement, so that's what goes in TVB um, in the platform and then the user has to decide on, on local dynamics, so we will uh, go into that later. Um, and the idea uh, behind this, the working hypothesis, so to say, is that uh, the brain functioning is constrained by the structure, so that there is a relation between structure and function. Um, and of course, with the modeling, uh, we can go very complex. There's a kind of, a, let's say, trade-off between uh, the uh, mathematical side, something that we can then really uh, explain and the detail. So we try to uh, explain um, yeah, uh, the um, brain dynamics, uh, the behavior um, yeah, with models that are simple as possible, as complex as necessary. Okay. Questions so far? It's okay, so you can interrupt any time. Uh, okay. <laughs> um, so how do we describe um, um, brain uh, dynamics or what, what it is? Basically, we, we are looking at time series, like what you see in um, um, EG, for example. So here's something very generic. Um, and we see that's a potential um, over time, and we see that there's a um, like a, a damped oscillation, okay, and so how do we explain here that the change over time? So what uh, basically in dynamical systems, what we do is to uh, um, to calculate the derivative of that. So this is like the speed, the rate of change. So if it's positive, uh, then we have a rise. Uh, if it's negative, so below zero, then uh, uh, we have it's falling, so to say. Um, Okay, so now I've uh, um, introduced here the potential as one variable, state variable, and then here's another one, which is the change. So how does this uh, um, time series look like uh, when we combine these two uh, uh, spaces, um, variables, and then span a plane, which is called uh, the phase space? Uh, oh, sorry, there's another thing here. So, dynamics in general is a study of how things change over time um, or space. So, here I give only examples over time. Uh, and now we're interested in how this basically was over time uh, looking at these variables. Okay. Um, so, again, here potential um, as a function of time, then the change of this potential um, with respect to time. And then here we have in this other plot, which is the state space or phase space, it's equivalent, then um, the potential versus uh, the uh, change. Um, these are our initial conditions. Yeah, that's um, like we've seen before. So we start here at zero, T zero, uh, and here. And that's basically these points here, the crosses, and in, if you take both variables together, then we are here, uh, you have minus uh, 0.3 for the potential and plus uh, 0.3 for the uh, change. And uh, then over time we see, so the potential is rising, so it's still positive, now it's changing, so it's zero, uh, goes negative, and now interesting, so that's how it looks then in this uh, state space. What we see over uh, time uh, that is spiraling in, uh, yeah, motion is uh, with a, in a spiraling in fashion is, is uh, appearing. Okay. Is this clear? Okay, fine. And I'm happy. So, um, 
Again, these are just for the terms, these are the initial points. And then if we let the system, so to say, relax, um, which is called in the trajectory, so that's then, so we release the system at this point, it's uh, doing its motion uh, over time, and uh, uh, which is then called in the state space the trajectory, and then we end up at this point. Yeah, so it gets uh, um, then zero in the end, okay, which is exactly this point uh, over here in the in the state space, and this is uh, called equilibrium. In that case, it's attracting. That's what uh, Petra uh, mentioned. So this is uh, this point is attracting, and uh, in other terms, uh, what we say, uh, uh, we can also say that it's stable. So to say, it's globally attracting. Um, if you have questions, interrupt if it's okay. Um, another time series would be an os oscillation. Yeah, then here again we have uh, the potential, so it's oscillating like a, uh, let's say, an alpha rhythm. So here we have the change of this oscillation uh, uh, with respect to time. Um, and um, then again, initial conditions uh, in the time series potential change. Um, of the potential with respect to time and then here in the state space. And then um, we let it run. Um, and then you see it, it looks similar at the, at the beginning. So there's something kind of an, um, a relaxing behavior, but now it's the opposite. Instead of going inside, it goes outside. Okay, it's, it's uh, unstable, so to say, it's uh, repelling. Okay, but now it basically falls into uh, such a um, um, in trajectory that is closed, which is called an orbit. And if it's attracting, then it's called a limit cycle. So that's important. So this is um, how um, oscillations, self-sustained oscillations are uh, modeled. Okay, so limit cycle is a closed trajectory. Okay. Um, I mentioned stability um, before, and there I will show um, yeah, some um, the example, simple examples of what um, um, we mean in general with stability. Um, so here we see the, uh, three different scenarios. We have uh, a valley, okay, here, this U-shape. We have a flat part, and then that's uh, like a mountain. and. Uh, here you will then see the time series uh, for the three um, uh, cases. And now we start um, um, throwing, so to say, a ball in it and then see how this ball is uh, uh, moving. Okay? So that's the red one on that side or the black one on that side. And both are basically falling down into the valley, yeah, to, the, to the minimum here. And uh, we see at the beginning uh, it's very fast. Yeah, it's uh, um, accelerating and then decelerating the closer it gets to this uh, yeah, into the valley. And, and that's what you see also in the time series at the beginning. It's very, it's rather steep and then gets uh, uh, flatter and flatter. Um, and this is stable, okay? Uh, the trajectory here would be this one. Uh, yes, this is more, uh, let's say, um, one could also, um, I will show it later then how to, uh, I mean, that's, let's say, an um, everyday example. I mean, you can do it at home in the kitchen, <laughs> let's say, with a bowl, <laughs> and uh, it's a sketch. Yes, exactly, yes. Yeah, you could. Yeah, so the amplitude would be, okay, here's zero, that's uh, this point, and the amplitude here is where we start uh, uh, the black, the right. and, and this would be then the other one, so we would need to turn it around, so, okay. Is this okay? Okay. Um, if you now do the same with the flat, so then basically it doesn't matter where we drop the ball, it will stay, it will not move, and then basically we get a flat line over time, okay, depending on where we drop uh, the ball. 
off. Um, then for the for the mountain, it's then I mean, uh, if you're good, uh, you can balance it. But then the status perturbation will bring uh, this uh, ball here either to the to the left or to the right. Okay, so this means so and then it goes down to uh, here infinity, which means in, in in time we have at the beginning it's very slow. So and then. Um, with the status perturbation, then we have uh, it goes away basically to plus infinity or minus infinity in space. Okay. Um, then again, the phase portraits. So these are now um, abstract versions of uh, these trajectories. We see that this is a stable point, a stable node, we call it, and then this is attracting uh, the arrows are basically uh, uh, summarizing the trajectories. Uh, um, that indicating the, the change uh, with time. That's attracting, uh, that's a stable node. And for the unstable one, here, then we see basically the, the errors are going uh, outwards. Okay. So these are basically condensed uh, um, pictures of uh, these, uh, these examples. Okay. Um, so now to make up. Um, that's a relation between uh, signals and phase portraits. Um, then, yeah, summarizing the different uh, states that are possible. Okay. Um, I will give you here this table. Uh, we have the nodes, just uh, uh, as shown before. So this is, these are stable states. Uh, we have nodes here. Uh, that's a stable node. So we see this uh, exponential uh, behavior. And then it's it's a constant in the end. So for this we need uh, only one variable to describe. Yeah, it's like then a movement like that. Um, if you see um, like before shown before an, a damped oscillation, then we need uh, two interacting uh, um, variables. So for this, it's uh, it goes um, it increases in one direction. Let's say in y. And then um, x has to pull it, so let's say, in the other direction, and then back. So we have an interaction, uh, a feedback interaction between two variables, uh, which can be then the potential and the derivative of the potential. Uh, and then uh, something can circulate. Okay. So here, in the end, it's a stable focus, which means then um, after a certain time, we, um, the system will relax uh, to, to zero, to baseline. Um, taking the same scheme, the same complexity, uh, we can also create oscillations like shown before. And then uh, the, um, the feed forward and feedback is basically strong enough uh, so that uh, a, a self-sustained oscillation uh, emerges. Okay, and that's uh, then summarized in the phase portray by, by these uh, limit cycles okay, that are attractive, uh, attracting from all sides. And if you go for uh, for higher dimensions, and it's just so uh, I'm, I'm not going to show any uh, examples. Um, that's then from dimension three on. Uh, theoretically, uh, they can uh, you can see irregular behavior, which is called an um, deterministic chaos. Uh, so you have an, let's say an, like a limit cycle on one plane, and then there's an accumulation of activity in another dimension that. Uh, uh, can give rise to very um, yeah, interesting, we call it also strange attractors, uh, uh, um, geometries, uh, and then in the time series. So there's no noise, it's really intrinsic deterministic, you see it in irregular uh, uh, time series. And this occurs then from um, yeah, the, um, variables for um, yeah, higher than, um, than three. Um, okay. So state space, just to go back to that, here is um, one example of, of states that's uh, actually the uh, state diagram of, of water. Uh, we have here um, the state of water um, as a function of the pressure and uh, the temperature. And we see basically that uh, water can take, can be uh, um, yeah, water itself, fluid, uh, then, then we have ice and then we have vapor. Yeah, and uh, so on. Um, a state space uh, basically uh, represents all possible states. Um, so these states uh, have unique uh, values. So if we see these these uh, areas basically. Yeah, we we can uh, measure them. Um, 
And then the bifurcations, um, these are these lines here, are indicating the change of the states. Uh, and then um, you can have, just for as an example, we go from ice to water by increasing the temperature, so we keep the pressure constant, and then by increasing, let's say we start here, increasing the temperature, then uh, the ice melts and we get uh, water, and there's something uh, where we can also translate this to neuroscience and say, okay, here the uh, neurons are uh, at rest, and then we increase the firing threshold, for example, and then uh, the, the neurons start uh, um, firing. Um, questions? Okay. Okay, we'll go into bifurcations. Um, like I said before, uh, they are, um, bifurcations are in the, uh, indicating qualitative changes um, in the system's behavior uh, be, uh, yeah, due to some parameter changes, like the temperature or the pressure. So, and then for, for TVB, for, uh, it could be uh, the input. Um, this can be a, a background activity, could be a input from other areas or temperature, like shown before, uh, for water as well. Um, then the functioning, then this threshold that we change something uh, in, in the functioning of this population. We can change constants, time constants, like uh, the, uh, um, um, the kinetics of uh, excitation and inhibition. Uh, or we can also, of course, change the, the uh, uh, connectivity, uh, meaning that we can manipulate the weights or like uh, the stroke example that Petra showed. Uh, that we can take uh, out of a, let's say, healthy virtualized brain taking parts out. Okay. So, um, questions? Uh, interrupt if it's fine. Okay. Uh, Petra showed that before. So we, um, our um, in the in TVB, our models are based on uh, um, experimental data, structural data. So we use. Uh, we build up then these network models. So here, uh, what you see in red are then the, the brain areas, lumps. So this, these are uh, um, population models here in that case, um, representing brain regions. Uh, in green are then the uh, structure uh, connections, connecting then these uh, brain areas. And uh, what TVB, what the user, what you have to do in TVB is to decide for local dynamics. So that's, uh, so TVB is then uh, uh, yeah, uh, equipping each of these brain areas with uh, um, a local dynamics. Um, and then by having, so to say, a dynamical model at each of these brain areas, the, um, the pra uh, yeah, this, this brain model starts to be alive and then things can, can interact. So these nodes are, are interacting and this is similar uh, to um, that's basically what Petra showed before as well. So we have these uh, flocking birds. Um, so these, these birds are uh, um, interacting and then forming basically in time and space uh, these nice behavior and that's, uh, so each of these birds could be a neural population. Yeah, that's then now on a different level. Um, and um, there it's interesting what uh, emerges out of their interaction. So. Uh, um, I mean, one bird cannot uh, form or make these nice movements. It's so appealing to us because uh, yeah, they, it's a collective behavior. Um, okay, and that's uh, basically what we are, or what I'm especially uh, interested in uh, of using TVB in this emergent behavior, um, like what we see here in the birds. Uh, and uh, as an example, this could be synchronization, then a phenomena, a phenomena in. Um, amongst brain areas. So what are these local models? Um, we can have, I have to interrupt it, okay. Um, we can have really uh, detailed models, like uh, single uh, neuron descriptions. So this is here from the Blue Brain project, um, where really uh, individual neurons are modeled, also, uh, including the morphology here. So they, it took them a lot. Uh, uh, of effort to um, simulate uh, here uh, 30,000 uh, neurons. Um, that's what you could do in TVB, uh, but I will focus, like uh, shown before, on populations. And um, so what, uh, yeah, to describe uh, 
the behavior of uh, such a, um, a piece of cortex. Um, we can be, uh, summarize that by using uh, a mean field approach and then we would end up uh, uh, with uh, something like this where we have uh, um, we had the projecting neurons here, the pyramidal cells, and then uh, interneurons, excitatory inhib uh, inhibitory interneurons. Um, how is this, uh, has this been done? Basically, we, have, we are looking at the physical space and then looking there for different types of neurons. So we try to distinguish between, uh, let's say, excitation inhibition, in, uh, uh, excitatory inhibitory uh, neurons, um, maybe also um, the, uh, um, um, the numbers of neurons, and then we, we come up with the classification. We can um, have here, let's say, uh, type 1 uh, to 3 to n of these um, neurons, and then we basically lump uh, all these neurons spatially to, to a point and summarize uh, the, the behavior of uh, these neurons. Okay, and then uh, you describe the, the, the basic circuitry of uh, uh, the, uh, the selected uh, uh, neural masses. Okay. Um, what can you do with such models? Um, so such models like uh, the Janssen Ritt model, that's the Janssen Ritt model that uh, Petra also mentioned before, uh, has been used to describe um, EG, MEG. Um, so alpha activity, like shown here, so that's then, so let's say, the simulated EG over time, um, but also um, epileptic uh, activity like insect spikes, spikes, tonic uh, firing. So that's uh, then as um, this would be a, a so to say normal behavior and that's then a pathological behavior. Okay. Um, I am now going into um, yeah, more into depth uh, how these neural masses are uh, functioning and, and then um, yeah, describing the states, what they can do and, uh, and also what they cannot do. Um, and then introduce uh, yeah, the bifurcations and uh, so the state space uh, of uh, this uh, this model. Okay. So um, what we see here is is a sketch of of, uh, of a neuron and uh, how does this neuron work? So we have here axons uh, hitting the the dendrite. So we have the synapse here. That's the dendrite, uh, uh, the soma, and then the axon again. Okay. So here in blue are so say, action potentials hitting the, uh, the synapse. And then on the uh, postsynaptic side, uh, we see then a, pos uh, a potential uh, occurring, a, a change in the potential. Uh, and um, this, so this postsynaptic potential uh, is then um, gets then summed up at the soma. Okay, and then there's a threshold function at a, uh, let's say, axon hillock. Uh, where it, uh, it's then decided if, uh, so if the potential is high enough, that's what we see here over time, um, that's the, at the axon hillock, if it's, uh, so let's say, crossing the threshold, then a new action potential is uh, occurring. Okay? Um, how to describe that? So, yeah, this, this, uh, this behavior that uh, we've seen here, so this, this red curve. So, for this, we use. Uh, uh, differential equations, so that's uh, um, yeah, um, the description of a postsynaptic potential of a single neural mass. And uh, what we see here is uh, the phi 1 is the, the membrane potential, then we have the current over here in green, phi 2, and uh, here's the input firing rate, so the, the, the perturbation. And uh, then on the uh, left-hand side, we, uh, like shown be before, we're describing the change, the change now of uh, membrane potential and uh, in addition then of the, the current. Okay, so this equation describes uh, uh, the evolution of the postsynaptic potential with respect to time. Uh, so now we can ask, is uh, there, uh, is, it, uh, is it going to uh, relax? to a certain value, to a baseline, after uh, an input is given or not. And uh, 
So for that, uh, we look at the uh, uh, equilibrium, and that's uh, happening when basically this change, or where nothing is changing over to, uh, with respect to time anymore. So this dtt is zero. There is, so to say, no um, um, motion. Okay. So what we basically do is to set this to zero. Okay, and then we see already here the membrane currents have to be zero. So there, there can be only um, then a definition of the potential with this remaining uh, equation here uh, that uh, um, basically describes, that's this, that's the uh, remainder um, describing the equilibrium. And then if you plot this again, so here it's now our parameter, that's the, uh, the input. Um, and like the action potential, and then we see or the, yeah, the firing rate to be exact. And here on the x, uh, y axis, we have then uh, the, uh, um, uh, the potential. And this equilibrium basically is now a line. So now, how this behaves um, um, uh, is it, so to say, attracting or repelling? Is it stable or unstable? And uh, there's a, a mathematical machinery behind. I'm not showing that. Uh, I'm uh, um, going back to this um, here. Um, you're going back to, to this analogon um, in mechanics. So we see basically it doesn't matter where we start that uh, we are approaching this uh, line. Yeah, so uh, over time, we will see this exponential behavior. It doesn't matter where we start. We, we are going to approach uh, the red. Uh, um, line here that's indicated uh, with the green arrows. Okay, these are the trajectories then. Um, this also means that actually a single neural mass can uh, do nothing. Yeah, it's, it's just uh, relaxing. <laughs> uh, so, um, what is important in, in this model, for example, is how these uh, neural masses are interacting. So, we see here the pyramid cells are excitatory, and then we get uh, uh, positive feedback through the uh, um, excitatory interneuron and then a negative feedback uh, through the inhibitory interneuron. And hopefully, I mean, you remember as, as soon as there's inhibition involved, uh, um, so if you have a feedback, then we can uh, uh, expect oscillations to occur. Okay. Um, questions? How are we in time? Okay. Okay. Um, so now I will go through um, uh, yeah, to present some bifurcations. So how to change states yeah, from uh, um, an oscillation to something that is more a, a damped oscillation or uh, just a, a going to a constant. Um, and I will um, introduce um, the basic concept, and then Paul is showing uh, simulations of, of these. Um, so the first bifurcation I want to show are, um, is a saddle node bifurcation. Um, what we see here, and that's the, the bifurcation diagram, we have uh, the uh, parameter to vary on the x-axis, it's alpha. On the y-axis, it's our it's x, it's, uh, for example, our potential. Okay? Uh, what we see here that um, uh, if our parameter is negative, then basically um, our trajectories here are simply uh, indicating that there is no stable um, point that we simply go through. Uh, there is no uh, stable point available. At zero, then uh, something is happening here um, that uh, yeah, this, this point is occurring. Um, but it's still not stable, so it's slightly attracting. So it, uh, it means that we are going to approach it fast, then it goes slower, slower, but then it will accelerate again and will shoot away. So uh, in turn, in, uh, Paul will show the time series later. Basically, both is unstable, uh, and uh, you see an increase of uh, the potential with respect to time. And for um, higher um, parameters than or positive, then we see actually two equilibria uh, um, occurring. One that is stable, so here the errors are indicating that we are approaching this one, this point. Um, uh, in this quadrant, uh, we are going to approach uh, this point, which is then a stable node, and uh, here um, that's a saddle, so that's repelling. And this go would go, so say if we are outside, it would go to infinity. 
And if we are inside this uh, cone, then uh, we would go uh, basically to the stable node. Okay, so yeah, let me introduce myself again. My name is Paul. Um, and we will now, after the theoretical introduction, we'll have a look at some practical uh, examples. Um, so all of you should have received the invitation link to um, H, uh, to the HPP collaboratory. If not, uh, please uh, tell me and I'll send another invitation afterwards. And if you accepted this invitation, you can log in to the Human Brain Project uh, platform. And there is actually where I also put the Jupyter Notebook, which uh, I'll be demonstrating now. So um, you can exit it, uh, download it, and execute yourself, um, or just follow along on this big screen or on your own computer as you like. So let me show you how to get there. Um, therefore, I'll just take a seat. But please, uh, any time you have, have questions, just feel free to interrupt. Um, so this is the login page. Log in with your credentials. and. Once you're logged in, uh, go to Collabs in the upper panel here. And then type in TVB Simulator. And then there should be only one um, collaboratory left, which you can choose. And so you, you don't have to follow now, but um, just introducing. So there's some um, description here. You can also see the activity log and also the team members uh, currently working here. And if you go on to the left menu, there you can see um, an option examples. And if you click on the arrow, all these example notebooks will pop up. Yeah? So on the left side, examples. And all these are Jupyter notebooks using TVB code to run simulations. Now, for this um, talk, we are just inter interested in one um, Jupyter notebook, which can be found in the end, the back end, uh, which is called Janssen and Ritt model bifurcation diagram. Yeah, so this already gives the uh, goal of this Jupyter notebook. We will discuss several bifurcations. Mm. Andreas in, will introduce the theory, and then I'll show some example simulations within the Jupyter notebook. And in the end, we try to stick them all together and come up with the bifurcation diagram of the Janssen and Ritt model. So if you click on it, the code should pop up in front of you. And let me increase the screen yeah, so we can all see. Okay, so. Some of you might be familiar with Python's and also Jupyter Notebooks, some of you not, so I'm just giving a short intro on what we're really seeing here. So Jupyter Notebooks is a way to combine Python code or other code as well, but mainly Python and um, a short documentation of what you are doing and also you can view your results at the same time. Um, so what you see and then in these cells in, with gray background is Python code. And then once you hit execute up here, it gets uh, on the play button, it gets executed, and the output um, is shown below. So I will not explain every step or each line of code here um, because that would take too long. We are mainly interested in the results of this, this code. Yeah. And I, I try to put some comments in the code, and I'll try to, um, which should explain the. Mm, uh, yeah, what, what the code is doing. So in the beginning, we int um, install some software packages, one which are necessary for what we are doing here. One is called yes. I don't have this, uh, toolbar. What again? I don't have this toolbox. Yeah. This toolbox? Yeah. Are you, you don't have the toolbar. Right. Okay, you can v set view and then toggle view bar or not. Okay. Okay, that's strange. Maybe you just have the notebook viewer then, and you cannot execute. But let's uh, put these questions maybe aside because uh, um, we're. Um, I'm, I'm want to show first what this code book, uh, your notebook is about, and maybe in the breaks we can. Uh, I can have a look. Okay. Um, I mean, we have hands-on session in the afternoons as well, where there's more time for interaction as well, and we we'll do the stuff together. For the moment, just uh, I wanted to show you where it is and uh, what it's doing, and in the afternoon, yeah. So we in installed some software packages was an, which are necessary, especially this one, PyDS tool, which is um, software for numerical continuation. I'll explain what that is later. Uh, some 
we installed Swig, some which is uh, uh, a compiler and another version of NumPy here. And then we include some Python libraries, and then we already get to our first example, the saddle node bifurcation, which was discussed by Andreas. So we use differential equations to simulate um, the dynamics of whatever we want to try to simulate. In our case, it's neural masses, neural populations. And therefore, we choose yeah, different uh, differential equations, different dimensionalities. We can observe different dynamics. In this case, we only focus on a one-dimensional model. Okay? This is, when I say model, it's not really now a um, biophysical meaningful model. You know? It just stands for um, one application to show what, what is possible. Just uh, giving you an example. So x dot, or x is our variable, and x dot is just another way to know that we, this is the derivative of x over time. You know, dx over d time, dt, what you saw before. Um, so it gives us the speed of this variable, or how fast it's changing as we move forward in time. Okay? And this is depending on two things. One, the parameter a, which we are free to vary or set. And the other one is x itself. You know? So the speed of this variable depends also on the position of x, of itself. You know? so Wherever you are um, depends on how far. It's like um, this ball example, right? If you're up in the air, you drop it, you are accelerating. So it depends on the position you are. And once you land in the, in the middle in this stable state, you know, then the speed is zero because you're not changing anymore. Um, OK, so now let's have a look how to use this to run a simulation. There's first some code for the continuation. And then I define the functions, some functions for plotting. Uh, not so very interesting, but um, this is the result in the end, okay? So we have a one-dimensional model, so we don't have really a phase space or a phase plane uh, where you can see oscillations, but we rather just have a phase line, which is indicated here, okay? So x, our x variable, can be somewhere on this, uh, on this phase line, okay? And x, as you can see here, is plotted on the x-axis, and x dot, which is the speed, is plotted on the y-axis. Yeah. In this case, it's possible, and higher dimensionalities, it's not possible to plot both things at the same time. Mm. And this curve, what you see here, is the speed of x. Yeah. So depending on the position, as we said before, and on our parameter a, which is, in this case, a is negative 1, uh, you have different speed for your var variable x. Mm. Give me five more minutes. Um, and then you can plot the speed either with such a curve. Yeah, this is given by our differential equation. And you can also indicate the speed by plotting arrows. Five minutes. Yeah, I asked Julie five, for five more minutes. Yeah. Um, the arrows indicate also the speed. So they show, they, all of them show to the left. What, why is that? Because our x dot is negative anywhere in the phase space or in the phase line. So anywhere you are with x, for this type of parameters, your speed is negative, meaning your x variable will decrease. Therefore, these arrows all pointing to the left. And now also the length of the arrow is important, indicating the, uh, the amplitude or the, the magnitude of the speed. Mm. Long arrows indicating fast movement to the left, small arrows indicating slow movement to the left. Now, this was now plotted the x, the position of x against the speed. Now we can plot the evolution of x um, over time. Okay, so we now change variables and focus on this plot. Now here, x, the position of our variable, is plotted on the y-axis, and time is plotted on the x-axis. And now, Andreas already mentioned the point of initial conditions or initial point. So we, we choose this and start somewhere in our phase space, or phase line in this case. We choose some initial conditions on this line, and then we move forward in time and then observe how is our variable moving. Yeah. How is x changing as we move forward in time? This is what we are interested in. Turns out, uh, since speed is always negative wherever we are, uh, x is always decreasing. Okay, so all these different trajectories trajectories here are different initial conditions, meaning we can start at different positions um, in our phase line, but as you can see, we always tend towards negative infinity because speed is always negative. Okay. Now, yeah, 
let's let's try to finish this. Um, for uh, right, and now the the, the goal of this um, um, particular notebook is to introduce the sense of bifurcations. Okay, so this is some dynamics we can observe in one um, configuration of our model. But what happens if we change a? So instead of a equals negative one, we now plot a equals zero. So what you see basically, this curve is shifted upwards. And at one point, it touches the horizontal line at x dot equals zero. So what does that mean? That at this point, the speed is ne uh, zero. Yeah? At this point, there won't be any change um, in, as we move forward in time. So this has some consequences, right? It's because now it's very crucial where you start uh, in the phase line. Uh, what type of initial conditions of x do you use? So again, this curve indicates the speed and it seems to be always negative instead of just one point where it's zero. And that's also indicated by these arrows again. So all these arrows point to the left. Mm, here they are very um, long, indicating huge speed. And here they're getting smaller and smaller. Um, and actually at this point there's no arrow, there's zero speed which it says that this point is actually stable. Or no, it's a fixed point, not stable. No? We, we had this um, term introduced before, but it's a fixed point. So if you start directly on it, um, you wouldn't uh, move anymore. No? But if you start somewhere on the right of this line, you would get attracted to this point. Yeah? So you move left until you reach a point and their speed is zero, you stay there. If you move, if you start slightly, just a slight, tiny, tiny bit to the left on the line, you would get repelled. So you move towards negative infinity. And that's what we are looking now uh, also in the trajectory plot. So again, x is now on the y-axis. And these the trajectories mm, indicate different initial conditions. And here, the x-axis is time again. So how does x evolve now as we move forwards in time? And as you can see, it's, or as I said before, it's very crucial now where you start. So I, I plotted here at mm, x equals zero, this um, dash dotted line, which indicates the saddle point, yeah? um, which was here again. x at zero, you have the saddle point here. Um, saddle meaning that it's attracting from one direction and it's repelling from another direction. If it would be attracting from both sides, we'll come to this later, it's a stable fixed point. And it's, if it's repelling from both sides, and it's an unstable fixed point. But if it's from one direction attracting, the other one it's repelling, means it's a saddle, okay? So what, that's the, the term you call it. And this is uh, also indicated here by the trajectories. Um, you choose different initial conditions, uh, which uh, when x is positive, you will approach the saddle yeah, from the positive side. And if x is negative, you will get repelled. And as you can see here, you tend towards negative infinity. And now just quickly, the last case, uh, it's one, one or two more minutes, sorry. And afterwards, uh, we're having a coffee break. If we increase a even further to a equals one, now what happens to our dynamics? Uh, now this is the interesting case. What happens, again, this curve, which indicates the speed of x, is shifted upwards again. And what you can see, there are now two intersections with the horizontal line at x dot equals zero, meaning actually at two positions in the phase line, the speed is zero, giving rise to two fixed points. Yeah, but now we have to decide on the stability of these fixed points. Because before, we um, called this a saddle because from one direction it's attracting, the other one is repelling. Now what about these two fixed points here? One uh, fixed point is laying at x equals negative one, and the other one is at x equals positive one. And you can already see from the, um, from the um, yeah, scheme here that an empty circle indicates an unstable fixed point and a full circle indicates a stable fixed point, meaning that this one is attracting, indicated also by the arrows. Yeah? So if you start in the neighborhood of this, somewhere here or over there, you get attracted to this um, fixed point. So x will tend towards one. And if you start here, if you start directly on the unstable fixed point, it's also stable, or you, you, you would stay there forever because speed is negative. But remember, just a slight perturbation to the left or to the right will then repel you to 
on this side towards negative infinity again, you know, because there's no other fixed point, no other objects you can be attracted to. And on the right side, you will get um, repelled and you end up on the stable fixed point. You know? And so stable fixed point, unstable fixed point, and this is the saddle. How do trajectories look like? Okay, dashed line here, unstable fixed point. Solid line, well, not really visible in between all the trajectories, but that's the stable fixed point. And as I saw, said before, if you start in the neighborhood of this stable fixed point, so every, anywhere x greater than negative 1, all these initial conditions, you will approach the stable fixed point at x equals 1. On the other hand, if you start in a neighborhood of this unstable fixed point, um, somewhere between yeah, 1 and, or n n less than 1, all these, you will get repelled from this uh, unstable fixed point and either here to the stable fixed point or you reach the negative infinity again. Okay, just one more minute and then we're done with this um, saddle node bifurcation. Really sorry. <coughs> um, I introduced this PyDS toolbox in the beginning. Yeah? So it is, uh, and I, I said it's for numerical continuation. What we really want to know now, or what a bifurcation diagram should tell us, is what happens as we, what happens to the dynamics uh, if we move, if we change one parameter a. Yeah? This is our parameter. We changed up here, and here in this example, we indicated it. We can calculate this pretty easy by hand. And uh, sometimes it's not so easy analytically. Then it has to be done numerically, and. We found these different points, yeah? fixed points, settle points, and we were really interested in those points because they give us a hint on the dynamics of the system. So it would be very nice if we can track these points or if we can tell how do these points move and evolve as we vary one parameter. Okay? And as you can see, here for a negative one, there's no fixed point or no object on the face line. For a equals zero, there's one settle point, and for a equals one, there's two points here. So what the continuation software now does is mm, it varies this parameter a and it looks for these points if it can find any in there. And this is basically what you can see here. Okay? So for negative values of a, as I said, there's no fixed points or no objects. Yeah, that's why here it's empty. As we approach a equals zero, there's a settle point here. And this gives rise, as we increase a even further to positive value, this gives rise to a stable fixed point and an unstable fixed point. And as you increase A even further, they both uh, grow apart, as you can see. Yeah? And OK, that's it, I think, enough for uh, <laughs> the morning. And then we'll continue after the coffee break. Thank you. So welcome back. I hope you had a good coffee, tea, you're refreshed. Um, so we would now continue with um, yeah, uh, introducing some bifurcations that are then uh, important to understand this um, local dynamic model, so the transmit model. Um, Paul just showed um, yeah, the calculation, so the integration of, of uh, the saddle node um, bifurcation. Where we basically um, have a switch from um, no stability to uh, a st um, a stability where only one point basically is, is stable and depends on the initial condition um, where we end up. Okay, so I will now uh, move on and um, go to oscillations and um, yeah, deal with uh, the, uh, yeah with the question how um, they emerge, um, and that's called. Um, Hopf bifurcation and John of Hopf bifurcation to be exact. And that's in a supercritical um, form here, which means that we're going to see a stable um, oscillation. So here now, um, as mentioned before, I hope you remember for an oscillation we need uh, two um, parameters, uh, uh, sorry, two variables to describe it. Yeah? For a line it's not possible, it's easier than using your arms and you see that it's uh, better uh, in the plane. Um, on the plane, and so the, uh, this plane is here basically x1 and x2. So this could be um, like the postsynaptic potential and then the current. Uh, and again, on the x-axis we have a parameter. This could be something like uh, this alpha, like uh, excitability. Okay. So for um, negative values, 
there we see there's actually only this line here. So the behavior uh, for negative uh, alpha, so uh, the system is less excited, we see um, uh, the spiraling in, uh, like shown before. So we start, doesn't matter where we start, we have a, a movement at the beginning is fast and then we will see that over time you're going to approach this point. And this is then showing over, uh, when we see the time series, then later Paul will show it, then it's simply a damped oscillation. So it's uh, fading away uh, with time. Um, so now what happens if you get closer to, uh, to zero, to this, to this point here, where obviously something is happening, and uh, then what we see, it takes longer and longer uh, to approach this point. And that's the bifurcation point. So we see that there's a change uh, in the behavior from uh, a relaxation behavior uh, to, uh, to this, what uh, uh, is the equilibrium or fixed point. Um, and then for positive alphas, we see that uh, it's still attracting, but now um, locally, it's actually re repelling. So here, if you would start uh, close to this line, then it goes outside, okay? So from here we go, we have a movement outside, uh, outwards, and then from um, outside this uh, orbit, the cycle here, then we, uh, it's attracting. So, um, and this basically for positive alphas, uh, if the system is uh, uh, highly excited, we see this limit cycle. And this limit cycle is uh, attracting. Um, um, basically, it's here in this um, bifurcation diagram with respect uh, to um, alpha, it is uh, um, here shown as this cone, okay? So this phase portray is simply now here a slice and then uh, this uh, um, intersection and then we see that it's from outside this limit cycle, it is, uh, so to say, uh, it, the trajectories are attracted to um, onto this uh, limit cycle. If you're inside this limit cycle, locally it's unstable, and then uh, we have a spiraling out uh, uh, motion onto this uh, limit cycle. Uh, so Paul will show the uh, calculation next. Questions? That's okay. okay. So we stopped here, right? The equilibrium curve of the sedonaut bifurcation, and now we continue with the Hoff bifurcation. So this is the mass behind it. Again, uh, I don't want to focus too much on the equations here. Just I want to say, or I just want to point out that now this is a two-dimensional system. Yeah? So we're now moving on a plane. It's a phase plane. Before we had the phase line. We just call them y1, y2. This is not not biological meaningful. It's just. Uh, mm, yeah, mathematical framework or mathematical theory behind it to generate such bifurcations and drawn off of bifurcation. Again, y1 or y2 and the dot above it means um, dy1 over dt or the speed of this variable or the change over time. Okay, okay some code here to, for the continuation. We'll continue then the equilibrium as we saw before, the stable point or the unstable points, and also the limit cycles. I'll show you what that means in a second. Then some more code to plot vector fields, and then basically in the end we loop. Mm, oh yeah, if we, we look just once very shortly into this equation, there's these um, state variables, one y1 and y2 here, and also there's a parameter b, okay? And this will be our bifurcation parameter. So before we call it a, we varied that to create the saddle node bifurcation. Now we have this parameter called B, which we also will vary to create the Andronov Hopf bifurcation. And this is already what we want to see or what we are interested in. As we said, there is now a phase plane. On the x axis, we have the state variable y1, and on the y axis, it's y2. And now our initial point. So we saw in one of the beginning slides of this talk is somewhere on this plane. Before it was on the line, now it's on the plane. And again, these arrows indicate the speed and the direction of the uh, state change. Okay? So long arrows again mean high speed, uh, small arrows low speed. 
a very slow change and the arrow um, or the direction uh, is also the direction of the change. And now here are just some sample trajectories plotted into the phase plane. So this would be some different initial conditions. Okay? The blue line starts here, the red line starts down here at y1 negative 1 and y2 also negative 2. And here are some um, yeah, more inner initial points as well. And basically what you can see is all of them spiral down towards the origin. right? At y1 equals 0 here and y2 equals 0 as well. So this seems to be attracting. Uh, anywhere we start in the phase plane, we'll get attracted by this stable focus. Yeah? Before we had a stable fixed point where we directly approach it. Now this is called a stable focus. We are where you first draw some rounds and spiral into it. So what happens if we now plot y1 over time? Uh -huh. So here we plot y1 against y2 and now we plot the state variables over time. So this starting point here equals T, t1 or t0, yeah, there's uh, the time point 1. Now somewhere then here is time point 2, time point 3, time point 4 and so on and so forth. And, and if you go into infinity you reach this fixed point and you stay there forever. So now that this, we take all these values for y1 and y2 and plot them on a new plot. Okay, so the x, the, this one is actually wrong. We have two state variables here, one in yellow and one in blue, y1 and y2. And we plot them across time. And what you can see here, yeah, so basically this is one very, very strong damped oscillation. You know, it makes one turn maybe, and then the rest of the oscillation are here very, very small, and you directly, or more or less directly approach this fixed point in the middle. A stable focus, okay? Now, we said B equaled negative one in this case. Now this is our bifurcation parameter, so we vary b and we see what changes in the dynamics of the system. For b equals zero, this is what you get here. So you still spiral down, you still can choose different initial conditions as you see here and up there, but you still tend towards the spiraling behavior and you will try to approach this fixed point or this stable focus in the origin of this phase plane. Again, we plot now the variables y1 and y2 over time and this is what we get down here. Yeah. Very, uh, now, now this over here was very strongly damped, but as, as we um, approach the bifurcation point, the damping is reduced more and more. So this is why we have these sustained oscillations as we move forward in time. Now what happens if we cross um, this bifurcation point? What happens if we increase b even further to b equals 1? This is depicted here. We actually create or we, we give birth to a stable limit cycle. You know, it's a limit cycle, which you can see here, and it's globally attracting. Meaning anywhere you start in a phase plane, whether here or in here or over there, you will always be attracted onto this limit cycle. And basically this is an orbit which is continuous forever. So you will cycle on it um, as you go forwards in time. And the interesting fact is before in the, the origin was a stable focus and now it changed its stability and it got unstable. So if we, uh, if we start directly at zero and zero, not directly on the origin, this is a fixed point again, so you wouldn't move because the speed is zero. But as soon as you slightly perturb, it's just slightest perturbation from there, you will then spiral outwards and approach the stable limit cycle. And this is what we see here. So we have sustained oscillations with fixed amplitude. Now I said we uh, were using this continuation software again. And be oh. Okay. Is it back? Yeah. Um, so it tracks the, the points of um, the stable fixed points, unstable fixed points um, in the phase plane or in the phase line. Okay, I think, uh, I hope you can still hear me, I uh, just shut off. Um, so for B uh, having negative values, you can see this on the left side here, uh, we have a stable, um, stable fixed point or stable focus, okay? So there's always, you will always be approaching um, this point wherever you start for different, um, different places in the state space. 
And at b equals 0, we said we have this Hopf bifurcation, which is indicated here by the blue point, h equals 1. And after this point, the origin at y equals uh, y1 equals 0 is getting unstable. Okay, so you start somewhere in near to this point, you will spiral outwards, and what you will approach is this uh, limit cycle. So we have to think as this uh, like, a, um, like a section through the three-dimensional plot Andreas showed you before. Yeah, so we are just focusing here on the parameter b and y1, but this thing here uh, actually just plots the maximum and minimum values of the limit cycle. So if you go back to the face plane, this is the limit cycle, right? And the maximum value for y1 is some here around 1, and they are at negative 1. And these two values are plotted, and this gives uh, rise to this cone, and actually in three dimensions it will be a real cone, and here you cut through the cone, uh, the particular section. Okay, and as you can see, the amplitude of the limit cycle increases as we uh, increase b. And this is um, the supercritical Hopf bifurcation. Yeah. Uh, do you have any questions uh, on this yet? Yes? Yeah, so actually uh, we have two state variables, right? Yes. Giving rise to a cycle, which you can see here. However, we are just... Is it working now? Okay. However, we, um, in, the, in this bifurcation diagram, we just plot one variable. Okay, and so we have to make some reduction. We cannot show the whole circle. It would be a line, right? Um, to make things in, inside the cycle still visible, we just choose to plot the minimum value of y1, or of this state variable we are interested in, and the maximum value as we move a, a very parameter b. So y1 is the maximum value of y1, or you can also look here. The maximum value of y1 is positive 1, and minimum value is negative 1. Now, this um, changes yeah, because the limit cycle increases as we increase b, and that's what's depicted here. Yeah. For b equals 0, or before there was no limit cycle, but then there's a minimum and uh, a maximum value up here and a minimum value for y1 down there. Okay, so this is all still uh, just mathematical theory and no neurons simulated on neural masses, but still we want to show um, what difference one and two dimensional systems can have regarding their dynamics. And especially what happens if we simulate a stimulus. So we run the system, we integrate it with some noise, so it will fluctuate you know, around, um, for example, around a stable focus or stable fixed point. And then at one time point, we hit it. We, hit it, yeah? we move one of the state variables outwards, uh, far, far away, and then we observe what happens as it comes back, or is it, is it gone, or what happens to the system as we stimulate it. Yeah. You can think of maybe evoked potentials in EEG or MEG. Um, so therefore, we use both systems. The uh, system we use to um, simulate the saddle node, hope, uh, the saddle node bifurcation and now the two-dimensional system for the Andronov Hoff bifurcation. So here are the equations, our integrator, uh, some setup for the noise. And basically, we will uh, implement a stimulus at, uh, after a quarter of simulation time half of the simulation time and three quarters of simulation time. And this is depicted down here. So this is our two-dimensional system. You can already see the oscillations. So if we would run it without noise, um, like we will spiral downwards. Oh, sorry, I forgot it's to say that we use this system for B somewhere here. So before the Hopf bifurcation. Yeah? Um, so basically, what we have is a stable focus. We would, stay, uh, we would spiral down towards this um, point here at the origin. And the other system, we uh, initiate uh, in this configuration, where there's an unstable and a stable fixed point. Okay, otherwise, we would have the problem that we would tend towards negative infinity pretty fast, regardless of any stimulus. So what happens? Um, we, in, we give some noise, so each time we look at the speed, we also add some noise that, that pushes us uh, around this stable focus, so we get these uh, small oscillations. Yeah? And after a quarter of simulation time, as I said, we throw a stimulus to one of the state variables, which, which kicks it uh, far away from the stable center. This gives rise to this huge oscillations here, and what you can see, there's also some transient. Yeah? So it takes some time 
to approach back the, the stable focus or at least to um, reduce the size of the amplitude below the size of the noisy oscillations around it. Okay, so after a stimulus, there's a certain time period where you can still see like after effects. And this happens uh, after the second and also after the third stimulation. Yeah, so this is the noisy part where you see some small oscillations and then you see big oscillations as we stimulate the system. Now what happens for the one-dimensional case? We have a stable focus here, we had, um, right, and at, at x equals one, and we add some noise to it, giving fluctuation around the stable point. And then, as soon as we hit, um, uh, as soon as we hit it, or we give it a stimulus, we push it far away from the fixed point here in the positive direction. And as soon as stimulus is off, we fall back onto it. So there's no transients. Uh, we directly approach back the limits, uh, the, the stable fixed point, and we directly get lost in this noisy fluctuation around the stable fixed points. So this is the difference. So me, what does it mean? Like if you want to model evoked potentials, any oscillations, uh, you again, you know, that's the point you need to a two-dimensional system at least to observe mm, patterns like this instead of this. Okay, then, uh, uh, do you have any questions on this part? Otherwise we go back to theory and then see the next bifurcation. So questions? It's okay. So you've seen basically it is uh, supercritical Hopf bifurcation and um, have it a stable focus and then uh, on the other side we have an unstable one with a, um, a stable limit cycle. That's wrong here. It's a stable limit cycle. It's attractive. Um, of course uh, like it's already indicated here, there also exists a subcritical one, which means uh, that an unstable limit cycle can exist as well. Um, so here everything is inverted, okay, from the signs. Uh, we have basically the same space. Uh, now for positive alpha, we have an unstable uh, focus. So we have this spiral going out. Uh, then at zero, it's again, it looks uh, identical. Um, uh, with uh, um, but the arrows are pointing outwards, so it's uh, unstable. And then um, for negative values, uh, locally it's stable, so which means if you're inside the limit cycle, then um, we get attracted to this uh, line here, to zero, to the zero line. If you're outside, then uh, the system uh, will go away <coughs> to infinity. Okay, so there's uh, uh, this limit cycle, this unstable limit cycle can act as a separatrix, so kind of separating uh, the outside from the inside. Uh, but still you can, uh, there's something stable inside, but globally, uh, so to say, it's unstable. Okay. Um, I would like to go back um, to, I mean, these are all local bifurcations, so which means that basically um, you can predict already, um, like Paul showed in the simulation with, with the noise, if you, uh, um, uh, the change due to the bifurcation. So you don't have to cross the bifurcation to see what comes after. So uh, for example here, that's what Paul showed, this uh, supercritical bifurcation where uh, you have the stable focus uh, um, on uh, for negative, um, alphas, then if you have noise, you're going to see always a, like a, a permanent um, uh, transient, uh, like a damped oscillation occurring, okay? So you actually know already what is uh, coming after the, the bifurcation point. So on, uh, why I'm saying that, uh, that there are also bifurcations that, uh, or changes that you cannot uh, uh, predict. Or, yeah. So and for that, I would like to go back to, to demonstrate this. I would like to go back to the saddle node bifurcation um, where there was no solution for uh, here negative alpha. So this uh, basically doesn't matter where you stimulate, uh, there's a flow. Um, uh, this trajectory is showing uh, that you simply flow through uh, the, uh, um, the state, so which means that the x, the potential, for example, is increasing. Um, 
and this also happens here in this part. So if, even if there is uh, uh, stability, then uh, the question is actually where is this going? Okay, so um, these arrows where they are pointing to. Uh, so this is here one dimensional example, um, and um, what happens if we increase the dimension? So this can happen in a more, let's say, realistic models, like also the Johnson Root, and uh, there are other objects, so to say, uh, in the repertoire of the dynamics, and uh, it can look like that. So uh, basically. Um, that's X, now here X and this um, uh, representation, this face portrait is basically this uh, line here. So we see, what we see here is basically uh, just this part for um, uh, positive alphas. So we have here a, a saddle, which is uh, this one over here, I hope you see that. And we have a stable uh, node which is that one. So here, this indicates that uh, they are connected, okay? So if you're close here, then you're going you're close to this uh, unstable one, to this unstable node, then uh, you're going to, to, be, um, to have a movement towards the stable node over here, okay? Uh, but now what can also be, uh, what happens if we are on the other side of this uh, um, unstable node? So it's here it's attracting, there it's repelling. Uh, that's this part. So what happens if we go in, in this direction? So we are initializing somewhere here, the system, and then what, uh, under certain circumstances, what can happen is that basically this um, motion, uh, the trajectory falls back then to itself so that it's connected and then basically it goes in a different path uh, than uh, back uh, um, uh, to, the, um, to the stable node over here. So that's uh, what we call uh, um, heteroclinic um, channel, heteroclinic because uh, two different objects are connected. Okay. Um, now what happens if uh, these, this unstable one and the uh, uh, stable one are colliding? That's what's happening at zero. Okay. So now they, they move towards each other as we approach from positive alpha uh, zero. Um, and then at one point here we see that uh, basically the, uh, um, the saddle and the node are colliding, building uh, this uh, saddle node, uh, but still we have this, this big uh, cycle, okay? Which is now a homoclinic one because there's only one stable point at this. And then for negative alpha, uh, per, uh, per meter alpha, then there's no stable point available anymore and then what can happen that still this uh, cycle exists and that's another um, um, mechanism to create uh, oscillation. So that's a limit cycle what we see here. Uh, but something that we could not predict uh, by just looking at uh, the local behavior which is saddle node. Okay, that there is a limit cycle occurring. So that's, that's an emergent property out of the interaction of the elements uh, in, in models. Okay. So Paul will show some simulations on that. Okay. Okay, so back to the notebook. Um, the slides where we left off was this one here, the simulation. And now we are coming to this Shilnikov set of node homoclinic bifurcation, and we'll introduce this now with a biological, biological meaningful model. Before we just had these example, toy examples, normal forms. Now we're using this morris lecar model, which is a um, model for the membrane potentials. Of, they, they derived it from a crab, so they used muscle, uh, not muscle tissue from a crab to derive these potentials. Nevertheless, they can give, uh, right, yeah, they, they give rise to um, Different patterns of oscillation are used for different for different explanations of excitability in neurons as well. So again, here the mass it's getting a little bit more complicated as you can see. But actually, what I again what I want to focus on here is v dot and w dot. It's a two-dimensional system, so we're still acting on a on a plane. Okay, these are just helper functions which appear up here again. Now. Our bifurcation parameter is this one here, I applicated. So this is like an applicated um, current to, or you give some input to this model from the outside. V is the membrane potential, 
of this cell and W is the um, current through um, potassium channels. And now let's see, okay, there's again some code for the continuation. Um, a little bit more in this case, some utility functions to plot the phase plane. And yeah, you see it's due to all these heteroclinic homoclinic orbits, which I'll show in a second, um, it's getting more and more code already. So this is, where, uh, this is what we want to focus on here. We are again on a phase plane. We know already this is one variable, this is the other state variable, and on this phase plane you have trajectories, you have these arrows indicating where to go and at what speed, and you have these points for um, fixed points. Yeah, they can be um, uh, unstable focusy, like here, they can be stable fixed points or even settled points. You know? So empty circle means unstable, black circle means stable, and half full, half empty means a settled point. So there's from one direction again, it's attracting, and through other directions it is repelling. Okay, so what you see here is also these lines, the black one here and the green one on the, on the top, these are called null clients. Yeah, so for one variable on this line, the speed is negative. So it just the other variable can move. Okay, so these arrows, for example, up here are very small, but at this point they are completely horizontally. So meaning there's no change at, on this line, there's no change for variable w. Yeah. And the same uh, holds true for the black curve and the ver state variable v. Meaning that at, if at one point on this line, um, one, uh, the speed for the change of one variable is zero, uh, meaning that where both of these lines intersect, the speed of both has to be zero. Okay? And this gives rise to fixed points, whereas they are unstable or um, stable. And that's what you can see here. So these lines intersect at one, two, three positions, and this is where we find our fixed points. Now the colored uh, trajectories here, the, oh, yeah, the, the colored curves are trajectories. Um, one is starting here from the unstable focus, the blue one, it starts really close to it, and where you can see it spirals out and approaches the stable fixed point over here. The other two orange, um, trajectories. One starts very close to the right of this settle point and it does, does all this loop to approach the stable fixed point and the other trajectory starts very close to the left of the settle point and will approach as well the stable um, fixed point. So this is what we call heteroclinic orbits. Uh, you uh, start from one object in the phase plane and you approach another one. Like these two are heteroclinic orbits. Now, we said I applicated is the current we applied to the model and this is our bifurcation parameter. So in this case, I equaled 20. What happens now if we increase I to, well, this 39.9 something? Um, is you, what you can see basically here, if, if, let me show them both next to each other. These two fixed points, these two objects, they approach each other. Yeah? And at this point, they merge actually. And what you see is you lose the stable fixed point and only this saddle point remains. Okay, so what does it mean? As I said, the saddle point has one unstable and one stable direction. If you start very close to the right, you'll do this loop and it approaches itself again. Yeah? So you do this loop and you come back to where you started. This is called a homoclinic orbit. Yeah, before it was called heteroclinic orbits where you start from uh, one object in the phase plane, approaching a separate one. Now this is a homoclinic orbit. You start it from one point, you approach yourself again. And again, from this unstable focus, you spiral outward and you approach this uh, settle point over here. Okay, so this is why it's also called a homoclinic orbit and settle node bifurcation because we have a stable node and a settle here uh, colliding with each other. And after they collided, so if we increase i even further to i equals 60, they annihilate, so they're finally gone. So you can also see this through the null clients. These null clients now here, the black one and the green one, they only intersect in one point. So the other two intersections are gone. And this point which remains is this um, unstable focus. And what you can see is uh, you spiral outwards and you approach the stable limit cycle, okay? So there's a stable limit cycle born through this homoclinic bifurcation of the Shonikov type. Is this clear more or less? Does it make sense? If not, please ask questions anytime. 
Yeah? So these two collide here, they vanish, and you remain with a stable limit cycle. Now, what implications does this specific uh, bifurcation diagram have for us if we want to simulate action potentials in neurons? Okay? Uh, and this is what this model is for, basically. So we will again try to simulate it at a little bit of noise and to see what happens to the trajectory as we start close to the stable fixed point. Okay? Mm, maybe not i equals 20, a little further approaching uh, 39, but I think I used 38. 38, yeah. And we are interested in this variable V, which is the membrane potential. So if we record membrane potentials, we can then track down the spikes, or action potentials, if, if this neuron or if this muscle has it. And this is what you see here. So V measured in millivolt and time in milliseconds and the, tra uh, the time series of our model now. As you can see, this time series is getting wiggly, again, because we had some noise in each integration step. But you, as you can see, there are several spikes um, across the time series. How does it look like in the face plane? Okay, this is depicted down here. As I said, I equals 38. So we're still before the bifurcation, the saddle node uh, homoclinic bifurcation, which means we have this unstable focus or the unstable spiral. We have the saddle point here and the fixed point over there. And as you can see now in blue, that this is the trajectory and it's wiggly because we had noise. And most of the time we have these sub-threshold fluctuations. Now this is these periods here where below, below a, a spike. But as soon as we cross uh, what we call a separatrix, because it separates um, the dynamics, uh, as soon as we cross the saddle point, if, if noise drives us uh, more to the right on this phase plane, you have to do all this loop to come back to your attractor, the stable attractor over here. Yeah? So if we start here, you give some noise on the system, you might fluctuate around this area. That's why it's so dark blue over here. And at some points, maybe noise is enough to push you across the separation border, and then you have to do this loop here, which describes the action potential. And yeah, so this is basically the case before the bifurcation happens. And this is again a bifurcation diagram where we track down the solution with the software we mentioned before. So now it's getting a little more complicated, as you can see. Um, we have the solid line here, which is the stable point, this one. Yeah. We have this dash dotted line, which is the saddle point, and they both touch each other and they annihilate in the saddle node bifurcation here. And then this third line up here, this is the unstable focus, okay, where you spiral outwards. And this up here and down there, again, are the minimum and maximum values of your stable limit cycle, which is created through in the end. This green line here is representing the homoclinic orbit, uh, the point where we have um, this bifurcation, this homoclinic orbit here and both of these fixed point touch. Mm -hmm. So uh, right at the bifurcation, we have a homoclinic orbit, we have the unstable spiral, and we have the saddle node. Depicted here by the green line, we have an unstable focus here, this is this point, we have the saddle node here, and uh, we have the homoclinic orbit, the green line. And from there on to the right, we only have this limit cycle and the unstable focus left. Okay, then I think we have all parts together to stick them now um, into the Janssen and Ritt bifurcation diagram. Are there any questions, further questions onto this specific bifurcation for now? It's get, it's, I think it's getting a little bit complex, <laughs> but uh, here with us, we are having then uh, to see how this gives rise to yeah, actually meaningful signals in EEG, for example, through the Janssen and Ritt model. Okay, so now we are going to the Jensen Ritt model, um, which is um, six dimensional, meaning that uh, we have six uh, um, variables. So, um, postsynaptic potential to describe uh, postsynaptic potential, uh, I showed two. Okay, and then um, we have three neural masses, so this uh, pyramidal cell. Uh, a mass of pyramidal cells, interneurons, etc., inhibitory. So we, in total, we have six, um, and 
uh, what we've seen so far is then, so let's say, looking for the equilibrium, then stability, so where it's stable or not, and then uh, how uh, stability is changing and uh, what the different uh, states uh, uh, are. So we have uh, now all the ingredients to, like Paul said, to explain, so let's say, the Janssen or to understand the Janssen Ritt model. Um, and uh, we start, um, so to say, with the, uh, oops. Yeah, that I showed at the beginning. I can show it again. Uh, but if this. Okay, we'll try it again. <clears throat> okay. It is this model that I'm talking about. Okay, so we have here the pyramidal cells and then the interneurons. Excellatory and inhibitory. Um, okay, I will shall go back. So now, first we, go, we look for the uh, stability. Now, uh, because it's six dimensional, you cannot display it. Yeah, uh, uh, it's so to say a projection. And uh, what we see from the state is only the postsynaptic potential of pyramidal cells as a function of the input. Uh, to the uh, to the pyramidal cells. Why pyramidal cells? Because uh, they are meant to generate uh, uh, EG and MEG yeah, because of their uh, um, uh, morphology, how they look like. Um, okay, and, and here uh, that's the equilibrium curve that we see. It's uh, not a line. Before it was uh, usually just a straight line. Uh, because it's uh, nonlinear, uh, the system is nonlinearly coupled and uh, um, this is basically causing this, this falling, what we see here. Yeah, and, and that's the uh, uh, equilibrium curve. And uh, what this already suggests that for a certain input here, uh, yeah, let's say if the input is uh, higher than, than four, then there's only one equilibrium. Uh, if it's lower than, I don't know, minus uh, one, uh, then it's also only one um, equilibrium is um, uh, available. And uh, there's a certain range here between minus one and, and four, let's say, and that's where they are free. So we, we are talking here uh, already about uh, uh, multi-stability. Yeah? Uh, um, there's not just one solution possible there, depending on where we uh, um, are. So um, yeah, what, uh, the, depending on the history, uh, we can take different states. Okay, so if they are stable or not, uh, there we, uh, we use this uh, uh, mathematical um, uh, machinery. Uh, I'm not. Uh, we haven't talked about that to decide if something is stable or not, but basically this is here indicated by uh, uh, the dotted lines. Okay, and then this is also indicating that if stability is changing on this equilibrium curve, that uh, we have a we see a, lo a local bifurcation. So locally, meaning on this uh, uh, equilibrium curve, something is is changing. And then, uh, voila, we see uh, uh, the different uh, local bifurcation. We see hub bifurcations um, over here. That's sub, uh, super critical. So here we should see a limit cycle somewhere. Oscillations should appear uh, here. It's uh, subcritical, so a separatrix uh, should appear. And then we have in the folding of the equilibrium curve, we also have uh, bifurcation points uh, set on node and a special one that I would like to uh, skip. Um, okay, and uh, if we uh, look then at uh, the limit cycle, so that's a, a, a special uh, question to address um, that uh, with uh, continuation uh, software that Paul is going to show. Uh, you can basically show the, uh, the maximum and minimum of, lim uh, of these uh, limit cycles. And we see, like expected here in this upper branch, that we have this uh, and turn off half supercritical that they are connected and forming this uh, um, at this branch of uh, uh, limit cycle. So if you, uh, we are up here, then we see oscillations. Um, there are another um, uh, range of limit cycles, which is over here. So and side of note, like I said before, that's a local one. We do not see the uh, the bur at this. You cannot see locally the, the, the birth of the limit cycle, so we have to take into account uh, uh, that there is something up here. And um, 
are going on uh, here and then what we see basically then if we look at this point for limit cycles that there is a huge uh, limit cycle appearing then I mean huge meaning that uh, the amplitude is uh, bigger than uh, the uh, other one over here the red one okay so um, just to summarize because the, uh, uh, this bifurcation diagram is not complete uh, because you do not see the, the phase portraits for different uh, uh, input values and uh, that's basically uh, done here. It's the same representation, so we have here again the, uh, the postsynaptic potential of the primitive cells as a function of the inputs and then here would be sort of, uh, is the uh, folded equilibrium curve and then now we see that this here is a node then uh, this here is a stable focus with the separatrix uh, around so the unstable limit cycle and uh, here we have two limit cycles that are coexisting then for a small range of input uh, uh, one with a large amplitude in blue which is basically showing then in the EG simulated EG or local field potential like a spike uh, wave behavior so this has been used to uh, model uh, epilepsy and uh, then here in red we have the other limit cycle which is uh, more harmonic uh, and this has been used to, to describe uh, alpha activity. Okay. Um, yeah, and that's what Paul is then going to simulate. Questions? It's okay. So now about the Jensen red equations. Um, again, I showed the math behind it, um, where, as you can see, we, we came from one to over two dimensional systems and now we skip three, four, five, we directly approach six dimensions. Um, really just um, don't focus too much on this. Um, it's y1, f, y0 to y5. Um, and our bifurcation parameter here is this mu over there, it's just the input, yeah, external input from other brain areas through stimulation or whatever onto the pyramidal cells in this Janssen and Red model. Okay? So what happens to the dynamics of these three neural masses once we change the input? Uh, the, we, we are running out of time so I, I really um, focus on the main results. For very low mu you can see we approach uh, stable, so this is the postsynaptic potential of the pyramidal cells over time. Okay? So what happens is if we move forward in time to the postsynaptic potential. For low input, mu equals 0.05, you approach a stable fixed point as you saw in the diagram and there's, there's where you stay for the rest of the time. Okay? There's nothing interesting or nothing more happening over there. For certainly higher values of mu, uh, 0.13, you get these spike, spike and wave patterns actually, as Andreas showed you in the pyramidal cells. And this is what made it so interesting for modeling epileptic seizures, for example, you know, because this is what you also see in human EEG, people are in a crisis. And if you increase mu even further, then you jump out of this limit cycle, explaining the spike wave pattern onto something more like an alpha rhythm, like alpha oscillations, in what you also can see in human EEG. Okay, so varying this parameter mu seems to be pretty interesting. Yeah? You can observe different kind of, uh, kind of dynamics as you move this parameter. So let me skip this. Uh, this is the continuation, and this is what you already saw from Andreas's plots, you know, the equilibrium curve, and you find different local bifurcations on it. And then from these local bifurcations, especially the Hopf bifurcations, you then start the continuation of the limit cycles. And uh, the, the, the scheme is always the same. Yeah? So um, solid lines mean stable, dashed, dotted lines means unstable. And limit cycles are depicted here, again, with the maximum and the minimum value of this one state variable we are looking at, y0 in this case. Yeah? So as you can see, there's stable limit cycles and unstable limit cycles, and then another one, another stable limit cycle up there, down here. Yeah, the minimum and maximum value again. Okay, so we said well, if we have very low mu, there's a stable point down here, and if we choose uh, our initial condition somewhere in this range, you will approach the stable point, okay, and you stay there for the rest of the time. As we increase mu, 
some value around here, point uh, 13, as I said, uh, you land on the big limit cycle, which gives rise to the spike wave patterns. If you move even further, if you increase mu to 0.2, for example, you land on this limit cycle. Yeah? This limit cycle is created at this point, and then it, um, yeah, it vanishes at this point again. So this white looks like a bubble or something. But um, it's, it's the section, again, which we, what we are interested in. So you end up here giving rise to alpha oscillations, what you saw before. Now, what happens if we um, dynamically vary this parameter mu? So we simulate the system, meaning we integrate it over time. We see what, hap what happens, what kind of dynamics can we explore. And then in each time step, we vary mu. So we want, what we want to do here is we start down here, then we increase mu to some value over here, and then we move back um, to lower values of mu. And what we will in uh, see then um, is something interesting, what we call hysteresis, or hysteresic effects. And this code basically down here does it. Okay, so this is what the result basic, uh, in the end is. Up here, this is the postsynaptic potentials of the pyramidal cells, and um, this is the time series, okay? So over time, we actually simulated um, 60,000 milliseconds or one minute. And, <coughs> sorry. And um, this is where we start in the beginning, so this is what we, uh, expected, right? We see some noisy fluctuations around a stable fixed point corresponding to this part down here. Yeah, this is a stable fixed point, no oscillation, no nothing. Um, but as we increase mu, you see these spike and wave um, patterns uh, becoming more and more frequent un until they are here systemic or, or rhythmic um, spike and waving, spike wave patterns. And this is due to the big limit cycle, which we just discussed. And as we increase mu even further than this, we leave this um, um, spike wave patterns and we approach the alpha oscillations. Okay, and this is depicted here. Because it's so compressed uh, and, and time, you, you can't really see the cycle, each cycle, but you see this vexing and veining of uh, the amplitude. Uh, this is pretty, you can see this pretty clearly here. Now, we increased mu, this is down here, yeah? So we increased mu from um, point, was it? Point, uh, point uh, 105, we increase it to point 0.14, and then we decrease it again. So until 30 seconds, we increase mu, and then we change the sign and we decrease it, yeah? This is depicted here. From zero to 30 seconds, we increase, and then we decrease. And the interesting thing now is we don't, add, uh, we don't end up at the state where we started from. Yeah? So this is what you see here. We started at a fixed point and noisy fluctuations and then we passed through the spike and wave patterns. But what actually is interesting is we increase mu, we stay up here and uh, actually the alpha oscillation doesn't change. So why is that, Andreas? <laughs> The reason for that basically is that the uh, uh, by stability and that the equilibrium curve is folded. Um, I go back here, maybe. Yeah, so it's folded, and then if you start somewhere here, so that's the folding of the equilibrium curve. It's now it's simpler to show it here. So we we start somewhere here. We, um, we move. In, in a positive direction, so there's a jump up, something that we could not predict. I mean, it's simply losing stability and finds then the stability up here. So where we have then these oscillations, okay? And then if we decrease again to the original value, to the initial uh, input value, uh, then basically we stay up here. So to basically full, uh, um, full um, close the cycle, uh, uh, go back and make a cycle, we need to uh, decrease further uh, the inputs uh, and then uh, to this point where we then would, so to say, uh, jump down and then uh, we can increase again and go back to the original value. Okay, so uh, the state uh, basically depends on the history uh, and that's what uh, Paul showed in the simulation. Is there, do you have questions? So we would not just go back to where we started, to the initial point, but we would also see similar behavior, like with the spiking that we had before, right? Yeah. Mm. Actually, you wouldn't see the spiking. You wouldn't? No. no. The, um, you see the alpha oscillation still. Mm. So here you, you see 
at the beginning was just fluctuations. Okay, then you had the spikes, so like uh, yeah, the spike wave uh, complexes, and then if you increase further, then you go through this bifurcation here, and you jump uh, up in this branch in uh, this harmonic uh, uh, limit cycle, the red one, basically for alpha. So and then, uh, if you uh, go back to the initial point, which is still, so to say, in, in the uh, the red. Uh, range, uh, so in this regime where you have uh, this uh, harmonic oscillations, then you stay there and you uh, qualitatively you, uh, you don't see a change. Yeah, yeah that's it. Okay. okay. So, any further questions? If not, um, that was the end of our talk and we will then continue with the architecture of the virtual brain. Ah, sure. Again? What's that? HDMI. <laughs> Let's see. Ah, there it is. Okay. Just give it some time. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What? Uh, maybe you can. Uh, so yeah. yeah. That, uh, oh, uh, so the value of mu mm -hmm. actually is the same in all graphs, right? In, in the Python graph, like same thing. There's a uh, this kind of changes. Yeah. And also in this Python graph, this yeah. They are the same. Yeah. So, uh, but for example, that. In, in this graph, the view changes from 0 0.11 to 0 0.14. Yeah. So that is in this very yeah. this part. OK, yeah. Right? And, uh, it's at the, it's uh, right at the bottom. Uh, yeah, yeah. Can I? Um, should I try? Sometimes are these are these adapters. Yeah, I want to kind of Where, where we um, maybe can let me show. I think it's this adapter. Sometimes they fail. Mm. Can I show you? Can you open up the slide? Okay. So. What we're doing is, okay, so here it's in another unit, but it's basically the same parameter. Yeah? So we start here, okay. yeah, and we start with our PSP down here. Oh yeah, sorry, have <laughs> the fun. So we start here, this is, right, and we start with our postsynaptic potentials, we start also somewhere below here, and it is attracted, as you can see, this is stable, yeah. Stable. So it, anything in this range here in PSP is it attracted? So you will approach this point. Okay. Now, however, for values mu around 50 to 100, there's also a second attractor. Yeah. There's not only one attractor. So there's a possibility also to be attracted by this one here, which is a stable spiral. Yeah. They're, the only way they are separated through these lines here, which are unstable limit cycles. Okay. Right, so let's say you start here, directly on the line, and now you increase mu, what happens? You, want, uh, you walk along this line until you reach this point. Now suddenly this line loses its, its stability. Yeah? If you increase mu even further, this line is gone. However, there's a new attractor now, which is the large limit cycle, this one here in blue. Yeah, the, minimum, the maximum and the minimum values of this large limit cycle. Okay, and you are here, and you are closest to this limit cycle, so you get attracted there. And you end up on this big spike wave oscillation. This is what you see here. The blue, blue limit cycle is this one. And if you move even further with mu, here suddenly also this big limit cycle is gone. Yeah? And you end up here somewhere in, the, in nowhere. 
So if you are here and suddenly increase mu, you end up here. Now what is the attractor in, at this point? Well, it's this other, the second limit cycle in red. Yeah? So if you are here, you will get attracted up here to this stable limit cycle in red. Yeah? And you stay on there. Now we move mu from yeah, 150 back towards 50. Yeah? So what happens? You are here, you are always on this limit cycle, just on the red one, always 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 on the red one, until this point where suddenly this uh, stable limit cycle is gone. Yeah, it's the uh, super critical Hopf bifurcation here. What remain, remains, however, is another attractor at this point, which is this stable focus. So now you're up here. And you have to, so before you, we started here at 50, yeah? We did this like this loop up here. Oh, it's not a loop. It's not closed. Yeah? So this is what hysteresis. You start here. You jump up there. You move back here, and now you end up here. To come back down here, yeah, you would you would have to move further along this axis until this point here, this one, the black curve, until this one loses its stability, yeah? and then the only tractor is the yellow curve down here. So. If you move across this point, you will fall back down here. Yeah. So to close the loop, you have to jump up here, go back down here. So the tradition only occurs when something is dis 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 something disappears. What again? The, so the transition only occurs when the, its uh, kind of trajectory disappears. Yeah, when the, when the stable point disappears or when the stable limit cycle disappears. And there's another attractor in the face plane, place, yeah. Face space. Yeah. Maybe can I show the next slide uh, as well? I, it's, uh, and the reason here. for that, if you can go back, I mean, this transition is that uh, this unstable limit cycle, which is here, is colliding with a stable limit cycle. So in the face portray in blue, we have the big uh, limit cycle. In red, inside the uh, uh, small limit cycle, and then there's another one. Uh, you may not see it uh, in dashed lines here. It's the unstable limit cycle acting as a separate track. So separating between inside the, uh, uh, the yeah, harmonic uh, red small limit cycle and then the blue limit cycle. So here at this point, uh, this separation is gone. Uh, so these the blue one and the unstable one are colliding, uh, vanish, and then only the, the red one is left. So that's, that's a global, another global bifurcation that I haven't introduced, but yeah.